Hello, it's Tom here. Before we get into this very special festive end of year edition of Last Orders, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has donated to our Christmas appeal so far. As listeners to this podcast will know, Spiked is completely free because we want anyone, anywhere to be able to access our journalism, our podcasts and our videos without any paywalls getting in the way. But to keep Spiked free, we ask those who enjoy our work to chip in. In fact, your donations have never been more important, particularly at a time when advertisers are so hostile to dissenting voices like ours. Indeed, even as our audience has soared in recent years, our ad revenue has actually gone down. Woke corporates would rather pass up the opportunity to advertise to you than grubby themselves by dealing with us. But who needs them? Over 70% of our revenue now comes from you, our readers and listeners and viewers. And as we go into Christmas, we're asking those who haven't given before or haven't given in a while or perhaps could afford to give just a little bit more to give and donate to our Christmas appeal. Your money really makes a huge difference. If everyone who reads Spiked on any given month gave us just £5 this Christmas, we'd be able to fund our work for two years. Plus, we'd be able to take Spiked to the next level. With your help, we can really make a splash next year and we've got lots of great stuff in store for you. So if you like what we do, if you think the media is an infinitely better place with Spiked in it, please do go to spiked-online.com slash donate and give generously. We also have a special offer on at the moment. During the Christmas period, those who donate £50 or more will get a free Spiked mug. That's UK donors only and of course, while stocks last. To get your hands on one of those mugs, go to spiked-online.com slash mug to make your donation and to fill in your address. Thanks so much. And now on with the show. Welcome to Last Orders, the Spike podcast all about freedom and the nanny state. In this special end of year roundup, we discuss everything from food fads to fag bans to the coming crackdown on the internet. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to Last Orders. I'm Tom Slater, editor of Spiked, joined as I am in every episode by Chris Snowden from the IA. Hello, Chris. Hello and Merry Christmas, Tom, and Merry Christmas, everybody. We're delighted to be joined on this very special Christmas episode by Kate Andrews, economics editor at The Spectator. How are you doing, Kate? I'm doing well, Tom. Thanks for having me. And Merry Christmas to you too, Chris. You're in a very Merry festive, all-black outfit. <laughs> and he came in wearing a pork pie hat for some reasons. I'm feeling festive, folks. I hope you are too. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas and a very, very happy new year. They're certainly going to have a wonderful Christmas when they hear what we've got in store for them over the next hour, which is a bit of a year in review about the nanny state, about a liberalism, puritanical policies from the government and so on. So we're going to roughly kind of break it up, I think, talk a bit about food panics, talk a bit about the crackdown on smoking, which is in the offing, a little bit about drugs and also a little bit about free speech. Stuff. Cheery stuff, isn't it? It's, <laughs> I wish I could say it's going to be an optimistic ride through the last 12 months, but it's probably not going to be. But should we start off with food, Chris? Um, mm, so why not? I want to go back over some of the food panics of the last 12 months, but we should also address something that's been in the news over the past couple of weeks, which is this idea that obesity is costing huge untold amounts to the UK economy. I believe 100 billion is 100 the- 100 billion now, yeah. Is the figure that's now nice been- round figure, isn't it? Indeed. And it's being headed, this new study or update on some numbers by our old friend Henry Dimbleby, the foods are also the co-founder of Leon, which is a kind of Jump upmarket, yeah, mm -hmm. fast food restaurant, essentially. So do you want to tell us a bit more about this? Are these numbers all they seem? Or is there something else going on here? It's just the latest bollocks, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it's, it's only a few years since the supposed wider cost to society of obesity, as they call them, were 27 billion. And then last year, it suddenly rose to 58 billion. And now it's 100 billion, despite obesity rates not actually increasing uh, in that period. Um, I, I tire of having to explain this, but it needs to be done. When people hear these estimates, they think that it's a cost to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So if you hear that obese people are costing society a hundred billion pounds, you think, well, that's not good for me. I'm not obese. Why am I having to pick up the pieces for these people who, yeah, and their willpower, whatever, whatever your interpretation of, um, people being obese is that it's not, I mean, most of the hundred billion, um, is worked out from uh, the quality adjusted life year. Okay. So the Department of Health sets a figure of 60,000 pounds a year for a quality adjusted life year. Now, obesity does kill people, right? They're obviously their health implications of being obese as with smoking and other things. 
Um, but the way to inflate the cost of society is by taking an arbitrary monetization of a year of life and then multiplying that across the number of years of life you estimate that people lose from being obese and then multiply that by the number of obese people in the country. And yeah, I guess you can come up with this enormous figure, but that is not a cost to society. Right? It's not even really a cost to the individual. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The debt. It's not... <laughs> I, I, the ultimate I, I, cost. Yeah. So, yeah, and look, I'm, it's obviously sad if people die prematurely, but we understand that without having to actually monetize it. And then they bring in all these lost, lost productivity costs. So they go, well, if these people hadn't died, they would have produced this and that and so on. Well, well they would have done, but they also would have consumed this and that and the other, right? With every pair of hands to work, there's a mouth to feed. To say that there's a cost of people dying prematurely is really the same as saying there's a cost to people never being born. But you wouldn't say that condoms cost society billions <laughs> of pounds a year, right? It'd be ridiculous. Or saying, oh, well, we're not letting loads of people emigrate to your country is a cost. It's not a cost because people emigrate to your country. People are born. Um, they, they then consume. Um, so it's ludicrous. I mean, the reality is that the, the actual cost to the government, which is really the relevant thing here, of obesity is negligible. Um, the IA, as far as I know, is the only organization that's done proper research into this, looking at the full net cost, which nobody else looks at the net cost. You take the savings away from the cost. And um, it was it was tiny. I mean, obesity is just not an economic issue. It's just not an economic problem. It's not in the top 100 problems that we should even be worrying about in this country. But because people like Dimbleby want other people to lose weight and eat the kind of food that he eats, um, they have to come up with these spurious cost estimates. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is worth pointing out that I think the Leon hamburger is like twenty percent more calorific than the Big Mac. That is true. So that is class coding yeah, going yeah, yeah. on in terms of what food is horrible. But it's more expensive, food, therefore it must be healthier. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the branding is one of being mm. healthy. It's a status Plus symbol, being, definitely. It's, yeah. it's, it's Leon. Um, uh, naturally, Kate Henry didn't just want to warn us about these potential projected costs he also wants to bring in i believe um bans on advertising junk food before the watershed he seems to be quite interested chris in all kinds of restrictions going do you think the government is going to or whatever government (laughs) um, we end up with at the end of the next election do you feel like the direction of travel is towards more kind of cigarette style restrictions on plain old food i hate to jump right into slippery slope arguments because i don't always think they're the strongest ones Um, and the government so far hasn't been hinting heavily at food restrictions um, however, when a, and I know we're going to come on to this, we don't have to talk about it too much right now, but whenever a government starts talking about essentially a smoking ban for the next generations, I mean, really radical stuff that as far as I know, absolutely nobody was calling for. It's really impossible then to start rule out to start ruling out what they might do um, on on a much smaller level, frankly. I mean, if you're going to go that far, then why wouldn't you be willing to look at advertising mm-hmm. or all the rest of it? Um, and of course, we know that the policies that Dimbleby is advocating for just don't work, you know, and, and we've seen it with the sugar tax in the UK. It's not working. It's bringing in more tax revenue, but that's because people don't change their behavior. So if you're claiming that obesity is the issue, um, that's not working. Now, if you want a bigger state, if you want more intervention for the sake of it, if you get a kick out of telling people how to live their lives and what to do, then these policies are fantastic and you should be advocating for them. But if you actually care about people's health, this has this has very little to do with the situation. We could probably be emphasizing, you know, actually getting people into GP appointments and dealing with the 7.8 million waiting lists on NHS England rather than talking about uh, advertising bans before the watershed. Um, and I remember working with Chris on some of those reports around obesity, tobacco, alcohol, what they cost. If you put together what tobaccos and, and smoker, if you put together what um, smokers and uh, drinkers pay in tax, they more than cover the cost of obesity. And they certainly cover their own costs as well. Um, you know, if, if we actually were to start changing people's behaviors, we were all healthy all the time, that would be a huge cost to the taxpayer. Now, I would like people to be healthier. I would like people to live longer. And if we have to deal with those costs because people are choosing to be healthier and live longer, well, that's that's a a public policy issue I'm happy to deal with. But this idea that you solve the world's problems, this idea that the taxpayer benefits Mm -hmm. if if we start bringing in these huge kinds of um, bans and regulations and crackdowns, that's that's actually just not true from the economic angle. It's also a nice problem to have people having too much food on offer and a lot of choice um, and not going hungry as much as used to happen. But Chris, this feeds into a one of the kind of long running stories of this year that we've been covering a lot in the podcast, which is the ultra processed yeah, yeah, yeah. food panic. 
which has been rumbling on for some time. I believe Henry Dimbleby has also been into it, but it's been very headed up by the celebrity Dr. Chris Van Tulliken, who wrote his ultra processed people book, wrote a very funny article earlier this year about him almost being kind of physically or his daughter being physically overwhelmed by the taste of cocoa pots for the first time. Mm. So these are the sort of people that we're dealing with. But do you want to tell us a little bit about the, uh, where the ultra processed panic is going? Do you think? And with some memorable moments from it from this year, I guess. I, I, I think it's probably heading towards smoking style regulation actually. You know, and, and it's come out of nowhere more. Yeah, like. pretty much. It's literally just one one guy's book, really. You know what I mean? And it's the Sunday Times Science Book of the Year. <laughs> really does make me want to kind of kill myself. Um, and we should say that his definition of ultra process. Merry Christmas, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> this is incredibly scientifically rigorous book. His definition of ultra process food, if memory serves, is something which comes wrapped in plastic and has at least one ingredient that you wouldn't have in your kitchen. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. That and the, to be fair, that I mean that's his simplification of it. But actually, the the, the real Nova classification, mm. as it's called, is is basically that. I mean, it's, <laughs> not, it's, it's not it's not simplified very much. Yeah. That really what is what it's about. It's anything that's made in a factory, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and I despair that it's the Science Book of the Year because it's got. I've pointed out very very obvious mistakes in that book. It shows that the guy can't even read the abstract of a study, let alone a full study. Um, That's a quick question. It's also badly written. Yeah. So, um, would things like sourdough be included in that? No, he love he loves sourdough for some reason. No, I appreciate that post pandemic everybody has some kind of sourdough starter in their kitchen, but pre pandemic it comes wrapped in plastic and you wouldn't have all those ingredients in your kitchen. I don't, well, well what 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 ingredients wouldn't you have in the kitchen for sourdough? Well, that's the other thing because like if it was my kitchen, there's very few ingredients in that whatsoever yeah, nothing, anyway, apart from salt and sugar. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure everybody like has the yeast that's necessary on hand to make bread. <laughs> no, truly, like would that count? Would that be classified? If it was wrapped in plastic, yeah, that would be right. processed. They, he actually likes sourdough. Like basically, fine. everything that is in a vegetable. He he, <laughs> yeah, he he went on TV to say that everyone should be eating sourdough mm. and claimed. I am not making this up, listeners. He claimed that the human jaw has shrunk over time <laughs> as a result of supermarket bread, sliced bread. And if we're all eating sourdough, our jaws would be bigger. And that's why I have people have to have their wisdom teeth taken out. He went on TV and said this. And the people around him went, wow, I didn't know that. That's incredible. They didn't say, like, <laughs> you're, you're nuts. That's not how evolution works. You know? <laughs> In any normal university, he'd be on the side street just, you know, shouting into the air or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd think so. But no, he's he's, he's doing a documentary. Uh, well, he's, he's the executive, I don't know, executive mm-hmm. assistant that's made for a documentary. I was asked to go on it. It hasn't come out yet, I don't think. Um, Did you go on it? Or- no, I said, "Why are you asking me to go on it?" I said, "Like, speak to a scientist. You need to get a scientist on there." There's no point <laughs> me. There's no point me going on it. It's going to be Institute of Economic Affairs, probably funded by the food industry, so they would say that. You know? So there's no point me trying to do it. Mm-hmm. Get, I said, "Get a scientist on." I bet they don't. Um, but when they told me that he was the, the like consultant on this documentary, I thought, "Well, this is just going to be a stitch up, isn't it?" There's no point me even getting involved. Yeah. So that's coming out next year, folks. Something to look forward to. I have another question. <laughs> So if something's made in a restaurant uh, kitchen, yeah. it, it can it be ultra processed? Assuming they're not, mm. assu- assuming the individual ingredients are in nice uh, glass jars and nothing's being taken out and microwaved. If you're making stuff from scratch, so to speak, yeah. is whatever comes out of a restaurant's kitchen, then no matter the number of calories or the level of like, quote, health that's involved mm-hmm. in that food, can, that can't be ultra That's fine. Yeah, no, you okay. can you can make ice cream and chocolate cakes and all sorts, as long say, as it doesn't could, involve any emulsifiers. You could go or to a numbers. bakery every day and eat 12 slices of chocolate cake and claim that you're living a healthy, unprocessed Yeah, 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 you can eat, okay. you, you, as long as you cook But if you buy the sourdough from, this, from the supermarket in the plastic wrapping... It's We've the, got some trouble. It's the element of capitalism that is a problem here. I see. It's, <laughs> it's, the, mass, it's yeah. the mass production. If, if, mon- mon- if money is changing hands, then there's uh, something wrong. It's fine when money changes hands as long as it's the artisan bakery or the yeah, you know, exactly nice yeah. restaurant. Yeah, it's but, just um, a it's just falling into a very 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 long line of of not just bad food policy but bad recommendations. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not helping people by telling them like there are going to be a lot of people out there who want to lose weight. You know, and they may want to lose a little bit of weight. They may be looking at making a totally different lifestyle change. Um, and they're going to be looking for answers. And they're going to think, oh, well, this is the food start. This is, you know, these are credible people um, out there talking about how I need to avoid ultra processed foods. But if I eat, you know, three pizzas, so long as they're made in a really healthy way at a restaurant, it, it, it's fine to do that in a day. It's just, 
I mean, we've had this issue for for decades in which the government and then sometimes people endorsed by the government or just people with very big platforms give really bad diet advice. Mm-hmm. Henry Dimbleby said that exercise makes no difference. <laughs> like, so as far as he's concerned. That, you know. I can trump that. Van Tulliken said on Twitter that the idea, the very idea that exercise helps you lose weight was invented by Coca-Cola. <laughs> There's a conspiracy theorist as well as everything else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, you know, respectable conspiracy theorists, yeah. But, well, you know, so I think that bothers me because it, it's it, it, the assumption behind that. I mean, I don't know what they were assuming, but when I hear something like that, it makes me think that whoever's advocating it just doesn't think the people they're speaking to are very smart. And I say that because like, if we're going to be generous, right, the pushback is lots of people say, well, if you just exercise, you'll lose weight. And that isn't wholly true Mm -hmm. either, right? You have to be addressing the food. Food is a really big part of that. But exercise helps you to address the food. Exercise gives you more calories that you can consume. Moving your body is really important for weight loss. And so when people say things like exercise doesn't matter, it's like they don't think they can have the nuanced conversation with the public. They don't think they can be like, well, look, it's many different factors. And it's really tough. Mm -hmm. And it's willpower does have a lot to do with this. Uh, And you're going to have setbacks. You're going to have, you know, good, good weeks and months. It's like they can't have that conversation. So they just come out with things that actually aren't true. Um, or they try to dumb it down to the point where you're not helping people. Mm-hmm. You're not actually giving them a new way to live their life. Um, and that's why I go back to that point about control. None of this strikes me as as like really wanting to help your average person change their lifestyle. It's all about just bringing in the state and making it a bit bigger. Now, our listeners won't be able to see this, but Chris here at least can attest to the fact that I'm looking decidedly perkier than usual. And that's all thanks to Magic Mind, which is the world's first productivity shot. There's no alcohol in these shots, sadly, but they will make you feel really, really good. Magic Mind is the generous sponsor of this episode, and I'm a huge fan of their drinks. Since we got our first shipment of them in the office a few weeks ago, I can't remember my life without it. We journalists, we tend to stay up late and get up early, and coffee just wasn't really doing it for me anymore. Plus, I was getting a bit sick of those jitters that too much caffeine can give you. I needed something that was going to give me a mid-afternoon pick-me-up without also keeping me up all night. And Magic Mind is exactly what I was looking for. It gives me that little burst of post-lunch energy and it helps me power on through the rest of the day. I'm also pretty sure Magic Mind has made me way more productive. I can focus so much better when I'm not worrying about the inevitable crash you might get with coffee or energy drinks. And cutting down on caffeine means that I've been sleeping better too. And just because it's good for you, Magic Mind, doesn't mean it can't taste good as well. It's a matcha-based drink, which means the caffeine in it will take a little bit longer to release than in something like coffee. That's ideal to helping to reduce those stress levels and it also tastes great. The flavor is subtly sweet and not at all overpowering. So if you're looking to kick your coffee addiction or cut down or just change things up and try something new, I can definitely recommend Magic Mind. To get your hands on some, go to magicmind.com slash last orders. Plus, if you use the promo code last orders 20, all one word, you also get up to 56% off your first subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase. Once again, that's last orders 20 for 56% off a subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase. It also works if you already are a subscriber to Magic Mind, enter our code and you'll save on your next subscription payment. Our listeners will know by now that last orders, we don't go in for fad diets and supposed health foods, but Magic Mind has genuinely made me feel miles better. And if you decide to give them a try and are disappointed, don't worry. They have a 100% money back guarantee, no questions asked. So if you don't like it, they'll refund you within hours. There's zero risk involved here. So once again, that's magicmind.com slash last orders with the discount code last orders 20 for up to 56% off your subscription. And just a word to the wise, the 30 pack is the best value. Now, back to the show. Talking about bringing the state in control, I want to move on to smoking. Chris, we've talked about this sort of ad nauseum over the past few weeks. I'm just going to kick this question to Kate because um, we haven't had you on in a long time. And since we have had you on the podcast, um, the Conservative government has ushered in probably the most extreme prohibitionist policy Mm -hmm. of a lifetime, certainly in the form of this smoking ban, this kind of escalator to prohibition where the age is going to go up by one year every year until no one can buy cigarettes. I saw you wrote a piece recently about how you've bought a pack of cigarettes almost in solidarity as a consequence of that. It's the kind of pro-smoking position that we fully endorse on this podcast. But um, what have you made of that? And especially the idea that it's Sunak's way to a legacy. How do we end up to a situation where banning cigarettes is um, there's your a lot. place in history? There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I remember being at a party conference back in October and, you know, everyone's speculating what's going to be in the prime minister's speech on that Wednesday morning. 
And I was hearing whispers that were something like, you're not going to believe it. It's so exciting. You're not, <laughs> the Tory party is changing. You're not even going to recognize it. And listeners can hear me, you know, imitating these people with a smile on my face. <laughs> and we got to Wednesday morning and I was like, you're right. I don't recognize the Tory party. <laughs> um, what is happening? My, my poor colleagues are, are having to sit with me as, as we're watching the speech. And like, I think I blacked out on the pod, mm -hmm. on the rapid response podcast afterwards. I don't know what I said. I wasn't happy. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I was truly shocked. I, I think, I think, I think Rishi Sunak believes in what he's doing. I think that, um, in terms of legacy, in terms of you know his own personal feelings, I think this is one of those policies that he personally believes in. And that's not the way I like to see politicians govern because they all personally believe in a lot of stuff that doesn't give you the right to push it on to mm -hmm. anybody else. Um, and you know, we we now see briefings in the news about how Labour are thinking about making vapes. Uh, prescription based mm -hmm. and mm. and you know if you open up the pathway to do something like create two tiers of rights for adults in which somebody who's 64 one day can buy a pack of cigarettes and somebody who's 63 can't buy a pack of cigarettes you've basically opened up the pathway for just about anything um and so whoever comes next maybe it will be a another 80 seat majority for the tory party maybe it won't uh whoever comes next uh will be thinking well what would i like to do what, you know, what nanny state policy do I feel strongly about that I would like to, it's the kind of game you play with mates, right? Like, oh gosh, if you were like, if you had all the power in the world and you can do one thing, what mm -hmm. would it be? But I don't actually want to see that happen in parliament. Um, and I fear that something similar has happened with, with the smoking. Uh, I was so angry that a few weeks later, I found myself in Paris for a weekend with a friend and um, I had been thinking about this ban on the train. And I I, I I got off the Eurostar and I just went like straight to a shop and bought a pack of Vogue's. And I, listeners, I'm not a smoker and I, I'm not pro-smoking. I wouldn't recommend anyone does it. Um, I'm quite happy that the next generation, the Zers and all that uh, are not really smoking. Um, I was so angry. So I bought this pack of Vogue's <laughs> and, and I carried around for like 24 hours and I sat down at a cafe really quite drunk on the second day. And I had my first cigarette in 10 years. And I mean, it just felt like freedom. Yes. Um, I passed out an hour later because yeah, my, my, my body can't handle it. <laughs> like I got quite sick, but it, it was it was it was worth it. It was worth it. I was just so upset. Chris did the same thing after the nitrous oxide ban. He was. Um... <laughs> no, we're not. Come on to um, Chris. Have you got anything to add on the um, smoking or the the vapes crackdown in particular? Or shall we? Uh... No, well, just yeah, Kate. As I said it already, but these people, he does believe it. I think that's, yeah, that's the only explanation. It just, I know it kind of polls well, apparently, with people. Although Forrest also did a poll that found, found that most people, 58% of people in this poll, thought that if you're 18, you should be allowed to smoke. And yet, Ash, the anti smoking group, did a poll, found out that 67% of people mm -hmm. agree with Sunak's ban. So maybe the general public is not really thinking this through very carefully, well, right? Quite. So I think the messaging on this from the government has been very clever, but I also think very, very misleading. Mm -hmm. Because when they're asked about it, they say, well, we don't want children to smoke. And it's like, well, of course you don't. Mm -hmm. No one does. And it's not, and it's never going to be legal for them to smoke. We're not talking about kids. Yeah. Yeah. They just happen to be kids right now. We're talking about when they turn 18, when they're turning 90 you are going to have different rules for them than their peers. Um, I think it's, it's extremely bad policy. You can just think practically speaking about how disastrous this is going to be for your local shopkeeper and all the rest of it, having to ID people at the age of 73 to find out if they can legally sell them a pack of cigarettes. Well, it's not going to get that far, is it? Let's face it. They're going to ban it completely. Well, cigarettes. the rollback in New Zealand is spectacular. It's mm, my suspicion. Yeah. Well, they've got to conserve the government there. This is, this is my true suspicion. I'm, I'm speculating here. I don't know this, but... Does anyone think that the Tory government in particular, but even a Labour government, would have rolled this policy in without a country like New Zealand doing it first? Yeah. My suspicion is is no. And yeah. now the UK has to go it alone. I think it's going to be a really embarrassing experiment. Um, the sad thing is that I, I you know, I think Labour is going to be very much in support of it. If anything, they were talking about this before the Tories. I think my my deep frustration comes from the fact that. I kind of expect this kind of interventionist from a labor government. Doesn't mean I like it anymore, mm -hmm. but I'm less surprised by it. The fact that the the Tory party, which loves to cry freedom when it's convenient, is bringing in this kind of ban. I think I find that so much more difficult to deal with. And trying to save a generation who are not 
They're not doing anything. They don't, they don't smoke as much. No they don't now. drink. <laughs> the worst they do is use single-use vapes and then litter them on the floor and everyone gets really upset about that. <laughs> and they can work so, on that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's great to have areas for improvement. But, um, you know, smoking rates for the under-18s, just trying it for at, at mm-hmm. any point, just having your first cigarette and then being a, a regular smoker are, are the lowest they've ever been. So this this was a problem that was fixing itself um, and did not need the heavy hand of the state to come mm-hmm. in. And, and decide that they were going to tell adults one day what to do. Should we talk about drugs briefly? Which hasn't featured much in the podcast um, over the past 12 months. But looking back, there has actually been some significant moves, the one of which we talked, we gestured to briefly there, Chris, which was the ban on nitrous oxide, which was a strange one. Because as you remember, and as we talked about on the podcast, it was talked about not unlike the single-use vapes thing, on littering, littering terms. Grounds, yeah. So you had Michael Gove saying this blights communities because all those little canisters were yeah. found you know, in the middle of a park somewhere after some kids have had a little session there in the office. Yeah, so I might trip over them. And exactly. Die. Oh, exactly. <laughs> and nitrous oxide is a, is a drug so dangerous they give it to pregnant women during childbirth. Mm. So it's, um, it's really rough Ser- stuff. Serious drug, yeah. But it was a really old-fashioned um, drugs panic. You know, the tabloids dubbed it hippie crack for some yeah. reason. Like, I don't know where they got that from. <laughs> Because the hippies haven't been around for a long time and it's not a lot like crack. It's, yeah, it's the hippies had proper drugs, didn't they? Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, um, I mean, was that, again, just uh, an inevitability, Chris, that the they're going to seem to crack down on? Well, every, look, everybody wants them into ban. This is kind of the, the fundamental, almost existential problem, I think, is that politicians, they do believe in some of these things, you know, like Kate says. Uh, but this, the thing they reach for is always a ban mm-hmm. it's never let's create something it's never <laughs> let's allow something to flourish build it's something. let's find yeah let's build something right it's like what can we ban now yeah. and they ban so many things they're kind of running out of things to ban and so we get the, it's more and more extreme and it's terrifying you know looking 10 years hence um what what are these people going to ban next you know and um i in a way it's more worrying they actually believe it because I think I think people like you know, you know the, the for want of a better word the kind of metropolitan political elite whatever you want to call it is um, the things they're concerned about are so far removed from the concerns of normal people. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so many problems in this country. Just walk out the door. There's so many problems, and yet the things they're interested in is like petrol cars, smoking, mm-hmm. single use vapes, nitrous oxide. Like the softest of all soft drugs, you know. I mean, you know, every episode we we have a like, what would you like to ban because you don't like it. Yeah. Bit, you know, we, that's coming up later. Kate, so get thinking. Um, oh my gosh, we always we always question. we always ask our guest for a for a, a petty ban. If yeah. you were the kind of petty person who would just ban things for fun, and one of them for me would be nitrous oxide. Fine, these would be just you're gonna take drugs, take drugs. Don't fucking, <laughs> don't, don't inhale a balloon. Don't inhale a balloon of like something that makes you slightly dizzy for t- thirty seconds. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid. It shows how lame you know the younger generation are that have to resort to that i think i think you have to check your p- privilege chris some, oh, really? some of us tried cannabis once when we were a teenager and thought we had to go to the hospital so well, you don't re- you know you <laughs> don't react of us can you don't react well. well to any psychoactive <laughs> have you tried laughing gas <laughs> no i haven't tried you probably laughing probably again. nearly I probably can't it. handle it yeah <laughs> uh, like and i can't now it's banned so you know <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you can still get hold of it um Look, he's selling it out of his bag. There's just so. people banning things all the time. Ban, 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 yeah. ban. What can we ban now? What can we ban now? And then the pub, you get bloody opinion surveys. You know, oh, yeah, public support banning things. Yeah, we know. Public are terrible. Let's ignore them. <laughs> ban things. <laughs> also, if you ask anyone about that, because again, it's you're inviting someone like to just impose their preferences on the rest of the right. country. So at times like that, like our question that we're going to put to Kate a bit later, everyone thinks, you know what, I hate that. I wish they Well, that's late. what I've just said. I mean, I, I, if, I, if I wasn't a libertarian, I would ban nitrous oxide because yeah. I don't like it, you know? And that's not a good way to run society. Yeah. By just having the bloke in the pub going like, oh, I'd ban that. <laughs> we, can't, we can't carry on. There has to be checks and balances on what the government does. And they don't create anything. They're destroying things constantly. And also they can't do anything. like that's, is, Well, they can, but they, they, just they, don't, become, they haven't got the competence to do it. No, exactly. Well, they become more authoritarian, the more useless they become. So it's like, you know, you can't fix the problem with productivity. You can't work out how you're going yeah, to... Yeah, can't build out. a nuclear power station. You can't, can't build a nuclear... Dig a, a reservoir. Exactly. No, but who, who can dig a reservoir? You have to get a field and then dig a hole in it. It's they've, impossible. They've spent, what, no one like, can do that. That's why I haven't done it for 40 years. They've spent like... Bloody th- reservoir. 
<laughs> no one can object in the middle of nowhere. You're basically building a lake. Everyone likes lakes. What's the objection? Oh, no. Oxford City Council, the Lib Dems, don't want to build a reservoir here. It's going to be a blight on the landscape. Do you mean what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to cut that out. I can't swear. <laughs> Uh, that's very well put. But no, what you can do is you can stop people having a laughing gas. So that's great. Um, <laughs> before we move on, another thing that we should talk about is um, weed legalization or decriminalization, which has been something which, as we've often talked about, seemingly was kind of marching towards something like decriminalization. There was a lot more interest in it on a, in terms of political discussion. There was increasing numbers of kind of MPs who go on some junket and say, actually, it's a really good idea that we should decriminalize it. Um, and yet, I thought it was interesting that, Kate, that earlier this year, Keir Starmer really slammed the door shut on it. So he was mm-hmm. um, gave this speech where he talked about how <laughs> cannabis had blighted the lives of people in his constituency because the smell of it is everywhere. He was really kind of leaning into borderline kind of reefer madness stuff. Littering and issue, people. Littering issue as well. Lots on the floor, probably. When did they decide this was like the killer argument for everything was littering? Yeah. But maybe, maybe, maybe we should ban littering. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's another law we're not enforcing. We don't but, enforce any laws, we just keep making them. <laughs> But did you think that was significant, Kate, that even the, the supposedly, the party which has historically maybe had more MPs in it that was in, interested mm-hmm. in cannabis decriminalisation seemingly have come to the conclusion that if they're going to be on the right side of public opinion, they need to yep. close the door off on it? I mean, this was a wrong calculation that I made four or five years ago. I think I assumed when the US started really warming up to the idea of decriminalisation and legalisation as a genuine public health safety measure, that Mm -hmm. this was the better way um, to deal with drugs than it was to keep everything banned and criminalized. I I thought the UK would have to follow suit. I just thought, well, okay, if the US is changing, this is absolutely huge, especially given America's crazy criminal justice system. If the US, if, if even the US can acknowledge that its policy has been so wrong and that the war on drugs has failed, then surely... Europe is going to follow mm-hmm. suit in the UK. And and that hasn't happened. Um, and, and maybe some of our answer lies in COVID. Look at the way that different countries responded to COVID. Mm-hmm. We, you know, the UK had a lot of people who really enjoyed the crackdown on others, who really don't want people to do things they don't do, who wanted to keep nightclubs closed and who supported a 10 p.m. curfew even after 25% the pandemic. 25% of the population. Yep. 25%. Not Think about that, number. folks. Never forget that. One in four of your fellow citizens want nightclubs and casinos closed forever. I'll think about it every night before I go to sleep, Chris. I'll never, <laughs> I'll never forget. Um, them down. Whereas you look at you look at a you look at a country like America, which had really different responses on the state level, but actually more or less started to open up in June 2020 and never really closed down again. Mm-hmm. Certainly not in the same way. Um, so you know that that more small L liberal streak. You know, it's, it isn't in the UK in the way that I think a lot of us perhaps naively hoped it was. And politicians know that it's popular to be tough on crime. And Kiyostama right now in particular, who wants to show how tough on crime his party is because he thinks he can compete with the Tories in areas that are classically Tory, like the economy, like crime, like immigration. Um, and so he's coming out with things that, you know, are, are actually very center right in their thinking. Um, and, you know, it's a disappointment to me because if, if you are going to have something like a labor government, let's get the benefits from the liberal perspective. Let's get the benefits of a labor government. To me, that would mean something like decriminalization of drugs. That should be a position that that party stands for, that, you know, we don't go after the individuals um, because of a personal choice that they're making with their body. Go after the gangs and the crime. Sure. You do that by decriminalizing. You do that by legalizing. Um, let's regulate this stuff. Let's make sure that what people get is safe to consume. Um, that's what I would like from a Labour Party. But, you know, Sadiq Khan, he's been very wishy-washy on this. And, and you know, when the mayor of London realized that it wasn't popular to talk about this, he he pivoted away from mm-hmm. it. So we've already, we've seen this in the Labour Party for years. It is just disappointing because this is the stuff I would, I would really like to see if they got into power. I suspect I'm just going to see more of the nanny state stuff. Certainly seems bound for that. Should we talk about another... Um- this is one depressing development after another. I'm sorry about this. Mm-hmm. You two and Sounds our... like a really happy year we've had. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Wait till we get to the post bag section. Um, <laughs> but let's talk briefly about free speech as well, because it's something that we touch on every now and then on this podcast. But I think this year was particularly significant because the Online Safety Bill finally became the Online Safety Act, which in terms of legislation is a really significant shift in terms of how the government's going to try via Ofcom to regulate online speech. Uh-huh. It's gone through so many different 
iterations it was hard to kind of keep up with it it was i think began under theresa may so it's already gone through so you're gonna have to take a selfie if you want to watch porn i saw that the other day seemingly that's one of the offshoots of it because really? that was one of the things that they were keen and ushering in was kind before of age, or after right? or both <laughs> <laughs> not during hopefully thank you for that uh, contribution <laughs> but um aside from the porn thing which i know you're very keen to talk about chris is the um the, the issue is that the fact that it managed to be watered down it was going through parliament there was particular concern about this push for ofcom to regulate what they called legal but harmful speech is very kind of orwellian sort of measure that's been pushed away at least for adults but the problem is there's all kinds of dreadful stuff that's still in there it seems like what they essentially do is going to put incredible pressure under pain of fines on social media companies to crack down on illegal content, which again sounds fine, but the problem is how are they going to proactively pursue that? So they're going to have algorithms or they're going to have very risk-averse moderators mm -hmm. say that looks illegal to me and therefore they should clamp down upon it. Not least because even our own police don't seem to know what is legal and illegal when it comes to speech. That doesn't seem particularly good. It's also supposedly going to signal a, um, the end of encryption because it wants Ofcom to be able to mandate things like scanning systems, even for encrypted messaging. And as you were suggesting there, Chris, the thing that most concerns you, which is your, your ability to access yeah. online pornography. So, <laughs> just really tell me about that. <laughs> what, Chris? What's the deal here? So, you, you do you want to tell us a little bit about this selfie story? I don't really understand it. I just saw the headline. It is like, it one of those things? Where they're just trying to work out how to in, introduce this age verification thing. What, what could possibly ideas. go wrong? <laughs> what could possibly wrong go wrong with giving some God knows what company? Who's selling pornography? <laughs> <laughs> Sending them a picture of your face. <laughs> Very reputable there's, industry. There's absolutely no chance that's ever going to be used to blackmail you, is it? <laughs> We're going to find out. <laughs> it's absolutely mental. Is this legislation going to get rid of all the soft porn bots I keep getting on Twitter? Because if so, I, I could be leaning that direction. <laughs> I'm so sick. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think it's is it just me? Do you get? You must get these, Kate. You're a high-profile tweeter. Uh, you get the constant bloody "you okay, I'm hon?" You tweeter. You bored, hon, and all this. Well, I know some people say they don't see it. I think a you lot know what of, I'm talking about, don't you? No, a lot of like if I I've ever I've had, had to, to mute log so many porn. phrases to get rid of these bloody porn bots. If I've ever had to log into like my organization's corporate account at different organizations, mm -hmm. they get a lot of that. You don't get them yourself. Um. I don't think I get very much of that. Or maybe they tailor it to men. Maybe they think I'm interested in... <laughs> oh my God. It's got something to do with what, you're, what you're looking at on Twitter. But the, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've, I've, so I've really I've dropped myself in it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else gets this from me. <laughs> um, look, it's. I think this is one of those pieces of legislation where we're going to find out the horrors in it over like quite a long period yeah. of time because so much of it will come down to what the government wants to enforce. And... A lot of the conversations around the Online Harms Act, as it's now called, um, when you would speak to some ministers about it and you could you would talk about what the provisions in it could be used to do, you get a lot of responses like, oh, but we'd never do that. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, you you might not do it, but you are setting up the power for somebody else to do it. And, I, you know, it, with legislation these days, I always kind of think like, what would Jeremy Corbyn do? Like what, if, <laughs> well, if, yeah. if this legislation, so I also think, what, would, what would Jeremy do? <laughs> if this legislation were in place and somebody like Jeremy Corbyn came to power, what might he do with it? Cause you can't create and implement legislation, assuming you're the only person who's ever going to be in charge. And, and we actually did have a, a, an election in which that could have been one of the outcomes. So what would Jeremy Corbyn do is, is kind of my go-to. It is good that legal, but I'm, harmful. I'm, I met him last week. Did you? I had a debate with Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, that's nice. That's he was cool. a ni nice grandfatherly type figure. I'm sure he was very I was pleasant. surprised. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm, I'm, I, I think, think he was just happy to be out of the house. I think most people are very, very pleasant when you actually get them in a green room. Yeah, I didn't think he would be. I had a feeling he might be a bit sniffy, but actually, I didn't know he didn't really no, know that who it was, even though it was his main de de debating me. opponent. One of the... He's a nice guy. I mean, perhaps this is a, a spiked point. But, <laughs> well, no, this is a spike point, right? Like, you actually put people in a room together. Everyone's tends to be quite nice. Usually, yeah. Yeah, and in a way that just you, doesn't translate <clears throat> online. And I think people... I met Peter Jukes. You know Peter Jukes? Yeah. This is the old example. I don't know him. I met Peter Jukes, Jukes at a wedding, oh, a wedding in the summer. What a curious... And what a curious he night, hates Chris. the IA. And mm. me and you and everyone like that. <laughs> yeah, he's... <laughs> he's, he's <laughs> listeners, I should explain, he's a... Uh, runs the Byline Times. And uh, we have... Mosley Times. Uh, a mutual friend. So we ended up at the same wedding together. We got on like a house on fire. Got of absolutely did. wonderful. He hugged me at the end of the night. Of course you did. This is, no, I'm sorry. This is. I love these stories, right? This is real life, and um, I think so much attempt to shut down speech and to shut down points of view mm. comes from the fact that 
especially nowadays, you're engaging online. You don't meet each other. Everything is in a couple of characters. If you actually get people into a debating hall, the battle of ideas, like, you know, all that great stuff, um, and you put people in a green room together, like, it's not that they have to get along. It's that people naturally will, mm -hmm. and they can debate robustly on a topic. Anyway, this is this has nothing to do with- No, this is more interesting. Contact, but- um, Who have you met in real life is actually horrible? I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> I'm just happy to say that it's on one hand. You tell me later. It's on what? Sure, for sure, for sure, Chris. This is a really good sure. question. <laughs> <laughs> just between you and me, Chris. Um, the Online Harms Act still has a lot of really worrying stuff in it. And I think when we see a government decide that they want to push it, that's when we're going to see just how bad it is. Um, and as you say, Tom, I fear that what's going to happen now is you're, you're not going to get a crackdown on these weird bots that seem to be messaging Chris on Twitter with soft porn. You're going to be much more likely to get a crackdown on um, a publication's material. You're going to get more crackdown on YouTube videos talking about politics, talking about foreign policy, because the social media companies are not going to want to take the risk. And uh, that will be a bot's decision or that will be a person's decision in either circumstance. It's subjective and it's blunt. Uh, and And both of those factors make it really hard for free speech to thrive, especially online. I'll just look at my <laughs> muted words on, on Twitter. I, <laughs> this is what I'm up against, this right? So I've got, got Prince Harry, obviously. Mm -hmm. But you up for some, um, hi. <laughs> Would you hit it? Would you hit that? Would you smash? Yeah, I got you. I got loads of these. I still keep getting the soft bomb oh You're all acting like you've never seen one. Wait a second, that's not your mute words. That's your search. Is no, these are my muted <laughs> words. I have to, I have to, to wind you up. various words because otherwise I get inundated with these women. <laughs> so I don't think they're, women. Women, yeah. I don't think well, they're yeah, real right. women, well, Chris. The I'm sorry no, to disappoint. I, like a Georgian teenager <laughs> or something trying to make I, some money. I wasn't born yesterday. I know they're not real women, but they're, picture, they're photos. Of women. They come with photos. For you once, shame on them they and all that. With, <laughs> they come with, with topless photos. I don't even understand how they plan to make money out of it. I mean, if they say, would you smash? And I go, yeah, I would. Yeah. <laughs> what, what happens next? You uh, respond where, publicly? Where? You reply You reply all? Well, I haven't actually done that. <laughs> I, just, I, 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 I hide and block. But if I said, yeah, okay, you've got me. I am bored. Yeah. I am bored. <laughs> now what? What happens next? That's a very good question. Uh, maybe I should... I don't know. This, this, Maybe I should just reply and find out. This could make a great piece, though. So right, okay. Next time I get one, because I haven't oh, you could I haven't used all the words. This you could definitely pitch that like, among the porn yes, box yes, or whatever. Yeah, I am bored, yeah. yeah. I would smash. Now, <laughs> what, what's going to happen next? What's the next day? I'll tell you what. Find out. I'll report back next year on Last Orders. Peace on Spike, Among the Porn Box by Chris Noden. Thanks for doing that incredible piece of public sector journalism. <laughs> Investigative journalism at its best. Should we have a look at the post bag? Nah. Post bag, post bag, post bag. Um, it's bulging, eh? So let's reach into the a festive edition of the post bag. It's got a few questions is here. It festive, really festive. It's not festive themed yeah. at all, but it is themed around the issues of public health and also the general sense of everything going to hell in a handcart, which is going to be Happy even days. more pleasant. So we've got a question here from <laughs> Andrew Beckett. If COVID had never happened, would the UK be more or less of a nanny state than it is today with the proposed ban on cigarette sales to Generation Alpha, presumably that's the one after said. Is it? Um, Are we going back to the start of the alphabet? I didn't be. know that. There you go. You've learned something from Andrew. Yeah. Anyway, so w would the smoking ban have happened without COVID? What do you think, Kate? Um, I think it would be, uh, I think we'd be leaning away from the nanny state if COVID hadn't happened. I think COVID proved the power of the state. It gave people a lot of ideas about what they could do. Uh, I think the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to be fighting a lot more authoritarianism than we otherwise had to deal with um, because people realize that there are levers to pull. And, and if you pull them, people will comply. I also think COVID's created so many problems, especially economic problems, but it's created so many health, social, economic problems that it is easier for government to do things like ban smoking for the next generation to say they are, quote, taking action uh, than it is for them to actually tackle the huge post-pandemic issues mm. we have. Um, you know, if you wanted to talk about health, we could we could have a chat about mental health. We could talk about the people who who aren't off long term sick because of obesity, but because mental health issues have skyrocketed since the pandemic. But then you'd actually have to have a mental health strategy. You'd have to be able to incorporate that into the National Health Service. And we are so far away from that. Um, so it's much easier to pinpoint these things and just to bring in that slap on that ban uh, than it is to deal with all the horrible 
post COVID repercussions. Mm. Can I just add to that? I think there's agree. I obviously agree, but there's more to it even than that, which is that during COVID, the Department of Health got an incredible amount of influence, right? Mm -hmm. Gained an incredible amount of power because everything was about COVID, right? And um, Chris Whitty became extremely prominent. Everybody knows who Chris Whitty is. They probably couldn't name his predecessor, maybe. And the rumors in Westminster, Tom, are that Chris Whitty personally persuaded Rishi Sunak to do this. Chris, but people think of Rishi Sunak, uh, sorry, people think of Chris Whitty and they think, oh, COVID and standing up and next slide, please, and all that. Mm. He's actually also a massive anti smoking fanatic mm. as uh, an anti drinking and all the rest he of it. He doesn't look like a man who enjoys his. Like a session on the weekend, does he? He, he doesn't, doesn't sort no. of. No, he doesn't exude that, that, that you know, bon, bon viveur kind of you know, yeah. mentality. You know, <laughs> joy de vivre of Chris Whitty. Um, so apparently, he personally persuaded Sunak to do this. And then within weeks, was at this ridiculous COVID inquiry, which we haven't discussed, but we should. one of the most disgusting things of the year. Um, anyway, he turns up at the COVID inquiry for the second time, for the second module of <laughs> this four year fast. And uh, and then just basically slags off Rishi Sunak and said, "Well, yeah, we used to call eat out to eat out to help out, eat out to help the virus." Uh, so now the rumor is that Rishi Sunak's a bit annoyed by Witty. Um, so are you hoping that will make him turn against this? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's right. a level you, of you, yeah, just personal. Yeah, I think you're going to be hoping for a long time. I I'm not I'm not convinced. I think I absolutely believe there are lots of people around Rishi Sunak suggesting that he should implement the smoking ban. I also wouldn't be surprised if there are a lot of people who are saying, don't do this. Yeah. Um, because I don't think every person in government holds these like much more liberal attitudes, uh, to, especially towards individual freedom. Um, but I think ultimately, I, I suspect Rishi's arm didn't have to be twisted too much. Mm-hmm. Oh, it would go through, I doubt. Uh, they're, they're, banning, they're not just banning cigarettes, they're banning cigars. I, the, their greatest leader is synonymous with cigars and the Conservative Party yeah. going to ban cigars. It's crazy. Beat me up. I know you think that they're going Happy to, Christmas. They're just going to usher in a kind of across the board ban, but maybe one of it is just it's a gift to hypocrites because it will never if if this plan to just raise it slowly would never affect these people. So maybe that's something well, that allows them to get behind yeah, it. Yeah, it will because they'll ban. Chris, ban, ban mentioned, Chris mentioned that the public polls in favor of mm-hmm. the ban. They're not polling any of the people who are going to be affected by mm. the ban. They can't be pulled yet. No, by definition. Yeah. And Very they're only kids anyway, so who cares <laughs> who what you say? Who will speak for the yeah. smokers of tomorrow? <laughs> That's right. the- <laughs> who will speak for the unborn smoker? Yeah. No one. My well, body, my choice. Few people will, but again, I will. Not, not because we want them to smoke. <laughs> we want them to have the choice. I want them to have the people choice. People should be allowed to make bad decisions. They just- I've had this question before. You get it a lot. Apparently, it's like a killer question to ask yeah. anyone who kind of defends the rights of smokers. It's like, well, would you like your child to, 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 to smoke? Like, well, I genuinely don't care. I genuinely don't care. I have a child. I genuinely don't care whether she, she smokes or not. It's up to her, right? I would much rather that she lives in a free country than a country in which she's not allowed to buy tobacco at all. It's entirely up to her. She's going to be a grown-up. She's not now, but she will be a grown-up, right? There's all sorts of things. And then she can not... do what she bloody wants, but same as I did. But there's also all sorts of things you might not, what you would rather she wouldn't do that she is still free to do. <laughs> like, yeah, right. One does not. I don't want her to have a weedy suitcase. But exactly. If she wants to have one, <laughs> she should be able to do that. But this, this is, is a, We're yeah, going back to a, a, a yeah, throwback. Thing. I, w- I would frame it. <laughs> I, would frame I saw it. another guy got trapped in the gates yesterday. It was brilliant. Sorry. <laughs> say, say that. I would, I would frame it slightly differently. <laughs> I wouldn't want a future kid of mine to smoke, but that doesn't mean I have the right to stop them once they turn 18. Mm. In the same way, you wouldn't want them to marry an awful person or, you know, you you, you would have lots of hopes and dreams and things that you would hope mm. your kid- You wouldn't want them to, to join the Lib Dems or there's all sorts of things <laughs> you could come up with. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want them going to MAGA rallies, but like they would have every right, because I'm sure Donald Trump, you know, if I ever have a kid in 30 or 40 years time, will still be running for president. <laughs> so- um that's not for another adult to tell another adult, even if it's your kid. We've got another really depressing question. Oh, oh nice. Is Britain in a terminal state of decline? <laughs> 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 Who's that from? It's from a guy called Doug Allen. He, he actually just sort of pointed this to a, a, a piece by a um, friend of Spike, Paul Embry, which was suggesting that we are um, circling the drains. But um, <laughs> Chris, quick response. or uh, uh, yeah, Merry Christmas. Immediate yeah. response to that. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kate, what do you think? The mood music's bad at the moment, isn't it? It doesn't feel like, you know... It's a I think I'm going to mood to Argentina if things turn out. Right. <laughs> uh, and I why is Mr. that, Chris? Mr. Mr. Malou. 
whatever it's called. Mr. Malou. Is that what he's called? Is it Millet or... Senor Malou? I, I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know. I can't pronounce it. But if he can turn things around, even if he can't, to be honest, I think it'd be a better... Career. I think Argentina now, with 140% inflation and constant chaos, is still a more appealing proposition than Britain 2024. What do you think? It's a choice. I mean, it obviously does not have to be this way. It is not written in the stars that Britain is is doomed for a terminal state of decline. Um, but to turn it around, you'd have to have some politicians that were willing to address the health service, are willing to address pensions. To take a chainsaw to the various public services. Chain, yeah. This, well, uh, Millet's uh, well, OT. Partic- particular yeah. ones. And, and even, <laughs> you wouldn't even <laughs> have to necessarily take a chainsaw, but you have to address health, have to address pensions, mm-hmm. have to address planning, have to address energy. And then you have to have a public that's receptive to hearing that. Right. So, so basically, we do magical. <laughs> no chance anyone's going to do any of that. A Christmas miracle could be bestowed upon us, and perhaps we don't have to be in a terminal state of decline. I'm kind of looking forward to our future of decline in a way. We're going to sort of make the most of it somehow. Yeah, I could be all right. I and mean, there's kind of honor <laughs> amongst fees, and you know, the entire country falls apart, and tobacco is obviously going to go all black market i think there's increasing it could be a black market black markets aren't that bad everyone has a go at you know oh we should legalize drugs because it gets them out of black I mean, the actual the drug market i don't take drugs by the way folks but it works fairly well you know if you're I mean? not the at the start of the up. supply yeah, chain for uh, like decades inflation well, proof, yeah. Heard, yeah i'm not sure the people working around the jug lords are having the best time yeah, i know look i know there are problems down the down the, but the tobacco the black market is going to be a lot tamer than that it'll just be like a bunch of shops selling like egyptian marlboros under the yeah. table or something it'll be you know it's it's, it's not gonna be that bad the, you know all the the lights will go out obviously because we won't have any power <laughs> Uh, but we can That's the start, downside. We can light start. up our illegal cigarettes in the dark. We can <laughs> light, up, light up our illegal fags in the dark. We can light, you know, light some light fires. Light. It will bring the country together. The complete collapse of Western civilization will bring bad. us together. Our, <laughs> I think fires are quite bad for carbon it's emissions. Like that might mission. be banned. It'll, oh, that's true. We'll all come together. <laughs> what we haven't had in this country for a long time is something that really pulls us together through adversity. Yeah. People like COVID. A lot of people like COVID because it pulled us together, supposedly. Right? You know, this separate gonna, houses. This is going to be... <laughs> <laughs> Never having to see one another yeah, was fantastic exactly. for this, social cohesion. You know, this is going to be much better than COVID because we'll all be able to see each other. There won't yeah. be any lockdowns. There won't be any law. <laughs> any rules. Let's do what we want. You're just... Okay, do you think that the terminal state of decline is going to lead to some... Anarchy, anarchy, yeah. Authoritarian anarchy because nothing's allowed, but there are no, but, but apart from nothing, yeah. every, apart from everything being the banned, perfect, all yeah. rules are off. Every, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Everything's banned, but effectively you can do what you want. Right, okay. That sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> I think it that sounds, sounds good. That sounds really bad. Yeah, it'd be all right, man. Laura the Jungle. very dangerous. Just get a gun. It'd be all right. Oh, my God. <laughs> And now I, I would like to end on that very positive note, but we do have to end the podcast by asking you, Kate, the question that we ask all of our guests, um, something we introduced a little while ago now, which is to say, if you had one ban, Ugh. what would it be? Can I ban this question? No, you can't. No, it has to be something personal. Well, we've but- got to make that one of the rules. So the rules are you can't ban this question, that's number one. Uh, well, num- it wasn't a rule until right now that I think it's totally <laughs> a terrible there's question. No, there's no, you know. The, the, we make petty. Well, I said wheelie suitcases. I've also it can't said be worthy people wearing backpacks on the tube. That people getting in my way in London. Most of it comes people down getting in specifically in your way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They- <laughs> like shower, shower gel bottles of shower gel. Yeah, We've had people ban. want to ban Americans from the tube. No offense. That was one oh, that God. came up. Gosh, um, yeah. Jesus Christ. Oh, that was right. one uh, that were, what do we do what do we do on the tube that's so offensive I think they meant tourists do, I don't uh, think it was like a not, tube, not, I was going to say we are quite nasally and loud so maybe they're I just I think what they were concerned about was like someone you know <laughs> bouldering onto the tube being like where am I going is this the right thing that, I guess that's what anyone who slows you down in London yeah. okay everybody why do you have issues with bottles of shower gel I think you should well, use soap oh okay. wrapped in a nice salt that comes out I think you should use soap um, I hate this question it makes me feel sick um, <laughs> well, just some of them really annoys you, yeah. You know what? I get asked this question by quite a lot of people, oh, yeah? and I re- I've struggled to answer for a really long time. And it's interesting I'm being asked now because about a month ago I had an experience where I thought this is my answer to this question. Mm, yeah, it's really quite specific. I want <laughs> Go on. Um, I think we should ban the marching band, shutting down half of London, like all of the mall, all of Westminster. 
and cutting people off from being able to cross to the other side, unless it's a special occasion. Okay. So why is it? I get coronation, right? I get the big birthdays. I get the King's speech, all very important, shut down the mall. But why is it that you're allowed to trap people in St. James's Park and not let them out? Because the marching band's going to do a 30-minute what, what whatever. What marching band are we talking about? I, d- I actually don't know specifically what the I occasion was. I had no idea was. this was such thing. So there's marching bands in Westminster. But... Um, I don't, I, I, I imagine it had to have been connected to the royal family. Not a bunch they, of young miscreants. They might have been. <laughs> <laughs> and With a sousaphone and I don't know action. what the occasion was because I didn't see it advertised anywhere. But I think... I think the band connected to, I, I don't know. They're marching down the mall and they shut it down for 45 minutes. And I kept saying to the police officers. Arrest them. How do I get out? How do I get to the other side? And they were like, you don't get to the other side. Sorry, mom, there's a marching band on. <laughs> and they were like, oh, Sorry, they were like, you, you can stand here and watch. And I was like, well, thank you so much. But I actually like, really have to, I, I really must be on my way. And then I was like, so how do I get out? And they were like, well, you don't really get out. You just, you got to go back. And it, uh, Thing is, I wouldn't ban it. I wouldn't ban it still, but you're make you're forcing my hand no, you're, here. You're real and it was a it was a true libertarian. It was you a, even ban that. It was a real Random inconvenience. Marching. It was a real inconvenience. Well, I like that because it taps into all my choices, which all involve people slowing me down when slowing I'm trying you to get through London. Down, though. Yeah. I like that it's not you can't slow people down. It's like you can't slow Chris Snowden down. No, no don't, can. don't slow anyone. Don't slow anyone. Oh, it's London. okay. It's more universal. But I walk faster than everybody else in London. You don't Literally walk everybody. No, I do. No, yes, no, I do. No, you don't. Ne- <laughs> I have never been overtaken in London. I'm constantly. We have walked down the street before, and I have thought to myself, "Gosh, he needs to pick up the." Police. I was in London on Saturday, which I'm not not normally in London on Saturday. I was coming back down from York, trying to get to the Worthing game, and I I always think in my head that London is less busy on Saturday, but it's bloody worse. Because you just got tourists. Yeah, so it's a you, weekend. Just yeah. <laughs> Why did you think it was less busy? Because most of the people in London are working, aren't they? I thought on the weekend they'd be at home just having a coffee or something. Yeah? <laughs> but you go, you go out. What you think city dwellers do? You know, city is... dwellers just sit at home. Is that what you think? Living have a like... nice cup of tea. Well, they're not. The they're not like commuting, them. are they? They're not walk, wandering, going to work. So I thought I almost think it's going to be quiet, and it wasn't. It was. It was more busy with more people with bloody massive wheelie bags is that what they're called what are you, suitcase. What are you, suitcase does somebody yeah. hurt you and with a wheelie bag <laughs> well, they, they, they are slower than anybody else aren't they oh, I and see. they get in your way they they have more more tail than anyone else so you're stuck behind you can't left or right you don't know sounds which way tough. to go sounds tough yeah. but the tourists they just stop dead I've never seen anyone stop dead so quickly as mm. tourists in London mm. you're walking along and they suddenly just bang stop yeah. Just like that. They've opened their mouth. And then no break, yeah. no oh, break I don't lights, know I, I don't no know signaling. Yeah. All right, get yeah. out of my way. Okay. Merry Christmas, everyone. And if you're in London next year, get out of my way. There's no better point to end this. <laughs> Chris, Kate, thank you very much. Thank and you. Merry too. Christmas. Merry Christmas. You've been listening to Last Orders. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Please do take a moment to leave us a rating and a review. And if you'd like to support the show, why not become a Spiked supporter? Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to sign up. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters.